Hello and welcome to the second video that covers fold and thrust belts. In the first video, which is linked to in the description, covers the theory and terminology associated with fold and thrust belts. This video will detail the sequence of events during formation of a model fold and thrust belt created by shoveling snow. This video assumes you are comfortable with all the terms and concepts in the first video. The basic way in which the model fold and thrust belt is formed here is by using a push shovel in some newly fallen snow, which is very similar to using a squeeze box to generate a model fold and thrust belt. Erosion, discussed in the first video, unfortunately is not part of such models. We'll analyze this trial of the experiment fairly extensively. Here I've slowed the experiment from real time somewhat. Next I'll break the video into a number of sections and analyze what is happening. For each section, I'll rock the video back and forth so the details of deformation can be seen. I'll then summarize the structures formed and their chronology. Okay, let's begin. In the first section, the fold and thrust belt is just beginning to form. In the upper part of the image, there are a number of in-sequence thrusts that form. Notice here and in other segments that typically only one in-sequence thrust is active at a time. In the lower part of the image, note that a back thrust and an anticline has formed. In the next section, a number of new in-sequence thrusts are generated as the fold and thrust belt builds, and we'll watch that section in reverse and then forward again. Here is the last image in this section with the structure shown. I only show the first and last thrust developed in this package of in-sequence thrust that is about two dozen in total. One thing to add is on the lower edge of the fold and thrust belt is a tear fault. Tear faults are strike slip faults that develop in fold and thrust belts that allow different segments of a thrust sheet or portions of the fold and thrust belt to differ in their total displacement. Here the tear fault develops because of the location of the edge of the snow shovel. Tear faults develop throughout the development of this model fold and thrust belt, but they won't always be pointed out. Based on what happens next, the fold and thrust belt must be under-steepened with respect to the critical taper, or the equilibrium slope of the wedge, as schematically shown. In the next segment, one out-of-sequence thrust takes up most of the deformation, and you can see the wedge taper increases to become closer to what the critical taper or equilibrium taper must be for this fold and thrust belt, based on the strength of the snow and the strength of the décollement. Probably the wedge taper is now oversteepened compared to the critical taper, as a new package of in-sequence thrusts are generated next. And here we can see that that is indeed the case, with the added complexity that a small back thrust also forms. And this is followed by a few more in-sequence thrusts. The taper of the wedge must be under-steepened compared to the critical taper at this point, based on the deformation observed in the next section. Next. Two main out-of-sequence four-thrusts develop that increase the wedge taper to beyond the critical taper, such that the wedge is now over-steepened. And hopefully by now, you can predict that a new package of in-sequence four-thrusts will develop and result in the wedge taper decreasing, probably to below the critical taper. The pattern is now becoming quite predictable as out-of-sequence thrusts develop in the wedge interior to increase the taper probably to the point where the wedge is oversteepened with respect to the critical taper. So what must happen next? A new package of in-sequence thrusts that result in an understeepened wedge. Now followed by out-of-sequence thrusts that result in an oversteepened wedge. Note here that the wedge height is now much higher than the back of the shovel and there is a lot of collapse of snow off the top of the wedge. Some liken this to tectonic collapse of mountain belts but this is not nearly as analogous as the other details of deformation we've been focusing on. Well, there's not much more to say. We can just watch as the deformation cycles through the predictable sequence of in-sequence thrusting leading to an under-steepened wedge and out-of-sequence thrusting leading to an over-steepened wedge. All right, let's watch it again in real time.
and we can watch another trial of the same experiment. Here I hope you'll see that the overall pattern is essentially identical to the trial we focused on. With that, I hope that between the two videos you've built a better understanding of how fold and thrust belts operate. And I'll leave you with some falling snow with crows calling in the background. <laughs>